Hi everyone, welcome to Past Business Intelligence Virtual Chapter. I'd like to thank our sponsors today, Pragmatic Works, who has been really, really kind in giving away a couple of prizes for or prizes for um, for our webinar sessions. So if you tune in and uh, fill in the survey at the end of the session, I will um, enter your details um, into our, into the prize draw. So I believe the uh, the giveaway for this um, this session is going to be an ebook. All right. So I've got a couple of uh, announcements from PASS before the uh, session starts today. If you haven't heard of PASS Summit, um, it is a great way to network and to learn all about SQL Server and BI, and it's hosted in in Seattle this um, this year. And um, and if you haven't registered, use VCSUM05 to get $150 of registration. And if you haven't registered yet, um, the price of $1895 um, US dollars is valid until September 26, so you may want to do that. And I am very terrible today because it is actually still not quite 6 um, a.m. where I am right now. I forgot to introduce myself, so my name is Julie Cosmano. <laughs> All right, so virtual chapter meetings, uh, we do have a couple coming up shortly. So tomorrow we have business analytics uh, with Azure Machine Learning. And um, next week we also have Power BI session with Matthew Roche, who is actually a senior program manager of Microsoft. So this month's actually a Power BI month for um, BI virtual chapter. All right, and we do have a few SQL Saturdays coming up in North America as well as international. Um, for example, there's one in Holland that I'll be attending, so if you are actually from around that region, please do join us. It will be great to see you there. And we always appreciate volunteers, so if you would like to volunteer, please uh, log into your uh, past profile and um, go to the My Volunteering section and then just enter your preferences there. And because we appreciate volunteers so much, we do award volunteers, for example, we have outstanding past volunteer as well as pa passion award winner um, for this extreme volunteers. <laughs> and if you'd like to stay involved um, with PASS, you can go to sqlpass.org and join the various social media out there um, that belongs to PASS. And you can also go to our website, which is just bi.sqlpass.org to see the latest um, news from the BI virtual chapter, for example, upcoming news and things like that. Um, and we do record our sessions and we do have over 30 hours of, um, of sessions actually on our YouTube and it's pretty easy to remember, so it's youtube.com slash user slash pass BIVC. So this session will also be uploaded as soon as, um, as, soon as I can. Usually, um, you might want to give us a better week or so, but I'll do my best to upload it as soon as I can. All right, so next session, which is next week, as I mentioned before, it's with Matthew Roche. So if you can attend it, that would be great. Um, I don't expect you to type in all this uh, URL, but um, if you go to bi.sqlpass.org, um, you can register from there. There should be a list of the uh, sessions um, on our website there. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kevin Goff, who is actually a SQL Server MVP, and he does a lot of um, Baker's Dozens um, kind of series uh, webinars or sessions. And today he's going to be talking about uh, Absolute Beginner's Presentation for Power BI for Office 365. All right, over to you, Kevin. I'll just uh, change the presenter and do the magic to let you show your screen. Okay, thanks. And first of all, can you uh, can you see my screen? Okay. Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, great. All right. Well, everyone, good afternoon or maybe good morning, depending upon where you are. Uh, my name is Kevin Goff, and uh, going to be giving a, as Julie said, a, an absolute introductory presentation on Power BI for Office 365. Now, as, as Julie mentioned, I've been doing a series uh, going on 10 years now called The Baker's Dozen uh, that I've done both in different magazines as well as in webcasts where I'll present 13 different tips uh, or productivity tips or whatever on a particular technology. And so I always try to follow the, that particular format. Just a very, very quick bio on me. I want to get to, the, uh, get to the examples here as quickly as we can. Uh, I'm a SQL Server MVP. 
I speak at uh, SQL Server community events uh, and SharePoint and sometimes .NET events, mainly in the Mid-Atlantic uh, in uh, central Pennsylvania, and also speak at the uh, SQL Live 360 conferences. The only thing you need to write down here is my email address and my website. My email address is kgoff at kevinesgoff.net, and my website, if you want to go up and see uh, downloads from other topics I've done or, or other SQL BI webcasts, my website is just www.kevinesgoff.net. And the slide deck uh, that I'm going to be going through will be up on my site uh, probably about an hour after we're, uh, we're finished here, and it'll also be, uh, it'll also be part of the, uh, the normal, uh, the normal uh, PASS uh, website and, uh, and anything associated with the, uh, with the link for the event. So uh, about an hour after uh, the presentation, the slide deck will be up there. All right. Well, so today's topic is, is 13 steps for getting started with Power BI for Office 365. Now, Power BI has been around for, oh, going on a year now. As a matter of fact, I remember around this time, right after Labor Day uh, a year ago was when the, some of the first uh, test releases of it were available. But certainly some things have, have changed uh, since then. And, and so this is still a very, very new topic for a number of people. And as such, this is an introductory session. And I just want to throw that, uh, that disclaimer out right now. If someone has built content uh, with Power BI and, and they deployed it to an Office 365 site, well, you might get a tip or two in here, but it's largely going to be review for you. This is really intended for somebody who wants to understand what the technology is all about and get an idea of, of what the steps are to, uh, to produce some content and to deploy it, and even how to set up a Power BI for Office 365 site. So having said that, there are two objectives here. First of all, is to give you some of the steps to, to get going. I'm not going to get into any area too heavily. Uh, certainly, you could have an entire hour conversation on, on one aspect of Power BI for Office 365. just want to give an overview of, of what's involved to, uh, to set up some content. And to give a general roadmap of, of the major components of Power BI and, and a quick glance at, at what can be built. Uh, over the years, I've done a couple of different types of presentations. Some of them have been deep dive, uh, where you take a look at a particular feature and, and just sort of dissect it down to the lowest, the lowest piece of detail. And then there are other presentations where the focus is really more on just showing, hey, what can be built with, with this technology? You know, sometimes you get inspiration for new applications based upon other, other things that you've seen. So that, that's really more the, the second objective here is to show what types of things can we, can we build. Now, this is an evolving technology. Uh, there are going to be new features out, uh, don't have an exact uh, timeline, but probably oh, end of this year, maybe beginning of next year, we're going to see more functionality in, in Power BI for Office 365. Some of that's been announced by Microsoft, so at the end I'm going to give just a quick bullet point list at, uh, at what's coming in the future for Power BI for Office 365, as well as some links to study further. There's a lot of good reading material out there, a lot of good blog entries from some probably some household names in the SQL BI area that I'm going to mention at the end. So here are topics uh, for today, the, uh, the Baker's Dozen 13-point uh, 13, 13 menu. Well, first of all, what is Power BI and Power BI for Office 365? Now, that's probably, that in itself is probably review for most people, but it's good to have a, a general idea of, of what, what the technology is about. Now, in some instances, Power BI for Office 365 gets compared to uh, existing SharePoint installations where people are using SharePoint either 2010 or 2013, and they've integrated it with, uh, with, with data for BI applications. Well, it's important to know what the differences are between the two and, and why Power BI might offer some, some benefits over going through the process of setting up something uh, with SharePoint on-premises and also what are, what are some of the things that uh, the SharePoint has that Power BI doesn't have. So it's important to know the differences between the two. There is certainly some overlap. Uh, what, are, what can we build with Power BI? I've got a couple of quick examples I'm going to go through. Again, I'm not going to hit any one example too heavily. really want to just sort of get a, a nice, nice lay of the land here of, of what the environment is all about. Now, I'm going to talk about getting started with, with setting up Power BI, what things you need to pull down, and how you provision a Power BI for Office 365 site and account. One of the things, uh, if, if you've set up uh, things with, uh, with Azure or anything in the cloud, 
you know that over the course of time, things can change. As a matter of fact, uh, I remember when I started looking at Azure a while back, I did some screenshots for, uh, for, uh, for, for a small manual I put together for somebody, and then a couple of months later, well, all of the, uh, the functionality, or at least some of it, up in the Azure site had, had changed. So at, at any one time, the specific steps that you, you go through to, uh, to set up functionality might change a little bit, but one at least, uh, one at least provide some information on what are the core steps for setting up a site and also for setting up a, a term I'm going to throw out here called a data management gateway. Now, if you don't know what that is, don't worry because that's what this presentation is all about. Essentially, a data management gateway allows you to push Power BI content up into the cloud, up into, up into a Power BI for Office 365 site, but have data refreshes point back to your on-site database. So I'll go over that in just a little while. Then we'll look at, in uh, item 6 through 10 at, at the core components within Power BI. They are Power Pivot, and within Power Pivot we have what are called the DAX formulas for any type of programming expressions we need, Power View, Power Maps, and Power Query. And all of these have some, some incredible functionality that I'm just going to barely scratch the surface on, but uh, give you some links at the end where you can uh, research further how these work. Also going to look at, uh, at how do we deploy content, how do we push content that we create in Excel up to a Power BI for Office 365 site. Uh, that's actually probably the easiest step out of all of these. It's really nothing more than a glorified save. You're going to look at setting up data refreshes back to, uh, to on-premise uh, on data sources. A couple of things to be aware of with that, uh, with that topic. And then at the end, I'm going to give you some recommended uh, reading and links and also a quick bullet point list of what things are coming up in Power BI for Office 365 down the road. So. We get started here. First of all, what is Power BI for Office 365? Well, you can ask that question to you know, 20 different people in the in the industry, and you might get 20 slightly different answers, and and that's great. Everybody can uh, can have their own perspective on it. Here's here's the way that I look at it. And when people ask me what Power BI is all about, here's here's the way I explain it. When some of my clients are interested in knowing more about it, there's really two general parts of Power BI. The first set is a set of, of Excel add-ins. And those add-ins are Power Pivot itself. That allows us to take data from relational databases or maybe from other data sources and create analytic pivot tables inside the spreadsheet that users can do their proverbial slicing and dicing with. There's also Power View. This is a new data visualization tool for creating what, what I call image or face style reports and charts. Now, that, that's just a term that I use. Uh, to differentiate between you know, 20 and 30 page reports you might build in something like reporting services. So PowerView is really more for, uh, uh, for visualizations that can fit in, in, in one screen or maybe just a few pages. Well, two other pieces that are part of uh, Power BI, add-ins for Excel, are called Power Map. Uh, used to be known as GeoFlow. Allows you to create some really fancy maps that, uh, that utilize Bing Maps under the hood. Now, I do a lot of work with reporting services, and I'm, I'm sure a number of attendees here have worked with reporting services as well. Reporting services has had for several years now the ability to, uh, to create maps. There's some very nice mapping features in reporting services, but the capability here in Power Maps really goes beyond that, as, uh, as I'm going to give a quick look at in, uh, in just a little while. And then finally, probably one of the most interesting items in here is an, an add-in called Power Query. Now, I'm going to reference a book by Chris Webb that if you get into Power Query, the book is an absolute must-read. Power Query essentially, the way it's been described is it's almost like ETL uh, for, for, for business users, for power users against, uh, against outside data. So as one example, I'm going to take some sports statistics from a public website, use Power Query, and very quickly create a chart out of it. Power Query has some really interesting features that are going to be of, of uh, that, that are going to make some people who, who work in certain industries very excited. So that's the first part of Power BI. Now, you don't need to be using the cloud necessarily or create an Office 365 site to take advantage of those first four features. If, if you're in an environment where you've got SharePoint or you simply just share, share spreadsheets on, on share drives within a, within a company network, well, you might just go with that first set of items and never take a look at, uh, at the cloud. But 
If your goal is to push this content up into some environment where people can navigate the content with a browser or even with a mobile device, well, then you want to take a look at the, uh, at the cloud services that are part of BI, Power BI for Office 365. This essentially allows us to have a, a subset of SharePoint functionality literally in the cloud where you don't have to uh, deal with the, the management of the of, of SharePoint of the configurations because a lot of that is taken out of your hands and, and it's simply managed up in a up in a cloud environment. Now there's some functionality that we do need to be aware of like data management gateways because we might want to set up uh, refreshes so that when our source data changes back in our in our internal network we want to update any content that we've pushed up to a Power BI site. So the second part of Power BI is the uh, is the cloud service offerings. Now uh, something I want to mention, uh, I, uh, sorry if I uh, if I did mention this at the uh, at the beginning, uh, for questions that uh, that come up along the way, uh, what I would like to do, if, feel free if you have any questions, to please post them in the uh, please post them in the uh, in the webinar site. I usually take them at the end. Uh, I have a tendency when answering questions to try to give uh, as detailed an answer as possible, which kind of makes it a little bit difficult to uh, fit within the hour of the presentation. So. Uh, Please post questions, but I'll take a look at them at the at the end, and I'll certainly stay for however long uh, however long I need be to uh, answer every question that everybody has. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at what's different between Power BI for Office 365, the cloud offering, versus SharePoint on premises. Now, I'm sure that some attendees uh, watching this right now have SharePoint in their uh, company or client environments, and they might be pushing pivot tables or reporting services reports or maybe performance point services dashboard pages up into SharePoint. So any traditional SharePoint 2010 or 2013 environment, we might have developers over here on the left or maybe power users creating content using Excel and using databases, either relational databases or maybe OLAP cubes, and then pushing them up into a SharePoint site, into a SharePoint Enterprise server. And then end users can obviously access that SharePoint site to, uh, uh, to gain access to the content that's been pushed up there and, and maybe even pull some of it down and, and combine it with other spreadsheets that they have. So whatever type of document collaboration features that, that a company might be utilizing in a SharePoint environment, you're, you're going to see in this kind of situation. Well, this has been going on for several years now, and this certainly works well, but for companies that haven't yet gotten into SharePoint, they know that they're going to have to deal with the SharePoint licensing and the maintenance. SharePoint is, is a tremendous product with, with just a, a huge amount of functionality, but there's a learning curve associated with it, and so obviously you, you need to have that kind of support, uh, support on site in some way, shape, or form. Well, what if you're a company that would like to take advantage of some of these capabilities in Excel? and push them up into a browser environment where other people can interact with the data, but you don't want to deal with, uh, with, with SharePoint. You don't necessarily want to deal with the maintenance or the cost or whatever with SharePoint. Well, what if, and this is the lead into Power BI for Office 365, what if this SharePoint Enterprise server over here were something in the cloud instead? so that we could still create our pivot tables and our pivot charts using things like Power Pivot and, and Power View and, and Power Query, have them point to SQL databases or the other data sources, but instead of pushing it up to a SharePoint site, pushing it up to something in the cloud, some external portal that could still render that content to end users, so end users could still get at the data and maybe even access it with something like uh, uh, like an iPad or, or some other some other mobile device. Well, we're going to see some examples of that in a minute. That that's really the basis of Power BI for Office 365. It is an Office 365 site that has uh, the Power BI engine incorporated uh, with it. It's managed by Microsoft and it contains what is essentially a, a stripped down version of SharePoint with simpler management features. It, it is not the full blown version of SharePoint. But for many organizations looking to do basic collaboration, basic slicing and icing of, uh, of pivot tables and pivot charts up in Excel, it's, it's going to be sufficient. And we can still get a large set of corporate users who can interact 
with this Office 365 site with, with, a, with a desktop or a laptop or, again, even a, a mobile device. So we can have different document libraries up in this SharePoint, or excuse me, in this uh, Office 365 portal, both with data coming from business intelligence applications as well as, uh, as other applications. Now, one thing we do need to be aware of is that even though we are, we are gaining uh, we're gaining the fact that we don't have the to deal with the with the footprint of SharePoint uh, on premises, or at least uh, dealing with the the management of, of the BI components of it. The Office 365 site is not going to contain all the features of SharePoint Enterprise. Uh, for instance, a a tool that uh, for anybody who's ever been to my presentations or any former students of mine from when I taught, uh, a tool that's always been near and dear to my heart has been Performance Point Services. Performance Point Services is not part of the uh, of the Office 365 offering. Now, at the very end, I'm going to talk about some some new uh, uh, KPI scorecard uh, and dashboard features that uh, that may make their way into Power BI a uh, little bit down the road. But for right now, something like Performance Point Services does not uh, does not exist in this uh, in this Power BI for Office 365 offering. Also, some other things to be aware of: the content that we push up from Excel into a Power BI for Office 365 site, there is a limit. A maximum workbook upload is 250 megabytes. Now, as I'm going to talk about a little bit later, the content that we push up into a Power BI for Office 365 site is compressed in some way. And I'll talk about that compression capability a little bit later. Now, one other little diagram here before we actually take a look at some examples, just, just to sort of uh, focus focus in on, on what's going on when we push content up into a Power BI for Office 365 site. Down here in step one, you know, we're either Power users or developers that might use Excel to, to create pivot tables, pivot charts using Power Pivot, Power View, Power Query, Power Maps. And then we deploy it up to a Power BI for Office 365 site that, that we have provisioned ahead of time. And then end users can get at that data, again, from a mobile device or a browser, even if they don't have Excel. Now, yes, most people have Excel on their machines, but the point is when end users are navigating against content in a Power BI for Office 365 site, there's no need for Excel locally at all, unless obviously somebody wants to pull down content. But one thing to keep in mind, if you weren't aware of this already, when we create Power Pivot and Power View content in an Excel spreadsheet, and push it up to a Power BI for Office 365 site, the data goes along for the ride. So let's say that we pull oh, 50 million rows from, uh, from an order table or from some transaction table. That data gets compressed inside of the Excel sheet, and then that is actually pushed up as part of the content in the Power BI for us Office 365 site. So it is essentially static content. Well, the question comes up, if you're an end user and you're looking at that data and then the data changes overnight or at the end of the week or however often it changes, how do users see the most up-to-date data? Does that mean that we have to you know, rebuild and redeploy that data back up? Well, that doesn't seem very, very efficient. Well, fortunately, that's where the data refresh comes in. We have the ability as, as part of creating that Power BI for Office 365 site to build what's called a data management gateway. And as the gateway implies, it'll, it, it essentially opens the gate for the Power BI for Office 365 site to tap back into the source based upon some schedule. So if we want to update the content on our Power BI for Office 365 site every night at midnight, we can set up a refresh to do so. But again, we have to provision a gateway and a data source in order to do that, and I'm going to go through those steps uh, just a little while. All right, well, what, what can we build with a Power BI for Office 365 site? Now, I'm going to reference some, uh, some links that have some really fancy examples, uh, fancier than anything I'm going to, to uh, show here, but just, just to whet the appetite a little bit on what type of content we can create. I'm going to actually tab over to the, uh, to the browser and uh, do, a quick, uh, do a quick prayer to the demo gods that uh, everything in the browser works okay. I've actually deployed up ahead of time a, a demo sheet that I've used for training and for, uh, and, and for showcasing to clients when they want to know uh, for the first time what, what something looks like up in a Power BI for Office 365 site. I've actually taken a spreadsheet with, with Power Pivot content and I've pushed it up into a site. So I'm actually looking at this up in the browser. 
Now, just like a spreadsheet can have four tabs, I've got four tabs up here that represent the four different views of data. Now, this is actually just a, a, a demo database for a, uh, for a, for a fictional book publisher. And, and uh, so the data is several years old, but really the, the, the actual numbers don't make any sense. It's just more a matter of demonstrating the mechanics. Well, we see up here I've actually got a KPI that's uh, rendering either good, bad, or somewhere in between for returns percentages. Uh, in, if you work in the book industry, one of the first things that's talked about in a, in a sales meeting is not what book is selling the best or what sales are. The first thing that's talked about in a sales meeting is what are returns? Because returns are, are the bane of, of the book publisher and really any, or at least most retailers. They're a fact of life, but we want to keep them down. So we might want to know, you know which areas have the highest returns percentage. Well, just in the same way that a, an end user in Excel can uh, click on the, uh, the row drop-down to sort the data. This content up at a Power BI for Office 365 site still lets us do that kind of navigation. If I'm going to click the drop-down here, and I haven't clicked the drop-down over 30 minutes, so this might, uh, this might take a second to it to refresh, or maybe more than a second, but it'll give me the ability to, uh, to sort on different columns here. So uh, like I said, I had not touched this in over 30 minutes, so that's probably why that's taken a little bit taking a few seconds here. All right, let's try it again. Okay, I want to sort uh, on a different value. Maybe I want to sort on the uh, on the revenue rank from uh, from from smallest to largest to see who's who's ranked highest in terms of uh, of revenue. And so I see here that Chapters Incorporated is uh, is the highest in terms of revenue. They're also one of the worst in terms of uh, in terms of returns, and you also have the uh, the slicer functionality that uh, that exists in Excel. If I want to you know, look at other book categories or look at different years or different customer categories, that same capability that's in Excel is also available here in the browser. So if I want to uh, take a look at ASP.NET Books as well, I can just simply uh, do a control click, and that'll refresh and update the data. To, uh, to reflect the sales for those uh, for those book categories. Now, uh, this normally it's easy to say this. Normally, it refreshes a little bit more quickly than this. It's not taking too bad here. Now, uh, not going to go through all the examples here, but just to quickly flip through here, there's another chart that shows a, uh, a sales and a uh, and a 12 month moving average. Something you might see in a retail environment if you want to know for any one month what's been the average sales over the last 12 months. So this is going to pop up a, a pivot chart here in just a few seconds uh, that renders the, data from the, uh, renders the data from the pivot table. Now something else worth noting here, while much of this could be done without writing any code, simply by pointing to data that might have been shaped in a data warehouse or a data mart, some calculations here might require some programming. In a little while I'm going to get into DAX programming. DAX was necessary to produce this calculation for the moving average, as well as the calculation for the returns percent and the, uh, and the ranking. So we do need to write DAX formulas uh, when we want to go beyond the basics of, uh, of rendering any data. And for people who uh, are familiar with some of the other features that were implemented in Excel 2010, like, uh, like sparklines, any sparkline that we created in, Excel, uh, in an Excel pivot table or pivot chart, will be rendered up here in the browser. Now, if you, again, all of this was created by an Excel sheet to begin with. If I actually tab back over here to an Excel, here's the actual Excel sheet as it exists back in Excel with the designer capabilities and everything else. And this was pushed up into the browser. Now, how we push it up, I'll get into in, uh, in just a little while. So again, I don't want to get too deeply into this. The point is that all of the different interactive capabilities for Power Pivot and Power View and Power Maps are, are available once this gets rendered up into the browser. So coming back to my slide deck here, again, we can uh, take an Excel spreadsheet, create Power Pivot content uh, with it using a SQL database or maybe an Oracle database or some other relational database or maybe even CSV files for that matter, deploy it to a Power BI for Office 365 site and the end users can uh, navigate against it using a browser or a mobile device. All right, well, how do we get started? If, if, if that at least what's the appetite uh, to make you want to see how would you, how would you start to put this together? Well, first of all, you need to pull down the add-ins 
uh, for Power BI uh, for, uh, for Excel. Now, I'm referring specifically to an Excel 2013 because several of the add-ins only work with 2013. Uh, really, the, the, the one that, uh, that predates 2013 is just Power Pivot itself. But things like Power View and everything else came along, uh, along the Excel 2013 timeline. So I'm uh, working exclusively with Excel 2013 here. Well, first of all, you need to pull down Power Pivot. And there are actually multiple sites you can go to to, uh, to pull down the, uh, the, Power, uh, the, Power Pivot, uh, the Power Pivot add-in. And I've got a link here that uh, walks uh, through installing and configuring uh, Power Pivot. Depending upon when you got Excel, and when you pull down Power Pivot, it might be part of it, or you might have to actually go in and add it as an add-in. And I've got the, uh, the steps for it here. It actually comes as an add-in as part of Excel 2013 Pro. Now, for Power Maps and for, uh, for Power Query, we've got separate links here to, uh, to pull them down. So Power Pivot separate download, Power View comes as an add-in with Excel 2013 Pro. Power Maps and Power Query, which you get into a little bit later, separate links for them. Now, if you want to see it get started, Microsoft has a lot of information up on their, uh, on their Power BI blog and some other miscellaneous sites. There's a very good one. It was actually uh, written back in July of last year, but uh, most of it still applies. And it's a really good overview of the other components of Power BI. Now, most people are probably aware that there are competing products in this, uh, what people refer to as the self-service uh, self BI area, products like ClickView, and Tableau are ones that you hear quite a bit of. Well, some people ask, is, is Tableau better than Power Pivot? Is, is ClickView better than Power View? Well, the answer is always going to be a matter of and it depends. There are features that are in Tableau that uh, might seem a little bit uh, uh, might seem a little bit less advanced in in Power Pivot or Power View. And there might be features in Power Map or in Power View that, uh, that you simply don't see in the other products. So it, it's always going to be a rather complicated feature-by-feature uh, -feature comparison. You obviously have to pick the tool that, that's going to be right for your, for your general applications. But certainly, th these add-ins are killer add-ins uh, to compete, compete effectively against some of the other self-service BI tools that are out there. All right. Well, the next step is getting started with Power BI for Office 365, it, it's one thing to be able to pull down all of the add-ins. I mean, most people are probably familiar with that, but how do we actually set up a Power BI for Office 365 site? Coming back to the browser here, I've got my basic site collection here, my bare bones site collection, with a public SharePoint site and a uh, and a Power BI site in order to push up Power BI content. Well, how did I get to here? Well, that's what I'm going to walk through here over the next uh, probably 10 to 15 minutes. Now, I've got four different links in the slide deck that you'll want to definitely take a look at. Well, first of all, if you want to pull down the trial, then you'll definitely have to look at least one of these. Well, it, the first link here is the main Power BI site. And I'm not going to pull up all of these, but just to pull uh, one or two up very quickly. The main Power BI site, uh, th this contains any, any up-to-the-minute uh, information on any new releases, uh, it's got links to uh, to the blog area, to uh, to the support area where there's a really good form area as well as a Q&A area. So this is the main site where you can go up and and get a trial or just uh, get an overview overview of Power BI for Office 365. There's a link to the Power BI blog, uh, the Power BI support and frequently asked questions area. Very good links. And then finally, uh, because people ask, you know, what's the cost for this? Well, there's a separate link here for the pricing and where you can pull down a free trial. Now, there are different pricing models depending upon what you want to do. The one that I'm actually using right now is the standalone Power BI site. Uh, I didn't have an interest in the, in the, in the version I'm using to actually have uh, uh, the ability to, to create uh, content up in the Power BI site, so I stuck with the, uh, I stuck with the, with the core Power BI standalone, um, standalone version. Now there's a free trial that you can go through, and it's I believe good for 30 days. And then and there's the uh, the pricing uh, either by month or uh, or for the entire year. Now when you go through the trial, or when you just decide to purchase it, first thing that's going to happen is you're going to be asked for your user ID and, and a password. And you'll definitely want to remember those because those are going to form your user ID. 
Now, I went with the long, my full name here, so my user ID wound up being Kevin Scott Goff at Kevin Scott Goff dot on Microsoft dot com. So that's going to be your uh, your user ID, and you'll definitely want to want to keep that handy. Well, after you provision your user ID, it's going to take you to the main the main Office Office 365 portal, and here is where you start to provision everything. So that's the first thing that's going to happen after you get your user ID established. It's going to take you to basically portal.office.com. And the only option that's going to be available there is the, uh, is the admin option. The rest of them are going to be disabled. Now, when I initially was going to do this presentation, I was actually going to walk through these. But given that some of these can take several seconds or even longer to provision, I just basically created screen captures of these. It might be beneficial to somebody if they want to actually walk through these later. Well, after, after you uh, get your account set up and you click on the admin option, you're going to be taken to the main admin center. And when you come in here, there are going to be two things that you'll need to, uh, to go through before you can start uh, provisioning a SharePoint site and, and start pushing some content up. We need to set up any services that we want to run, and we need to set up any additional users. So if you have maybe five users within your company or 20 users or however many, and they're going to access the, uh, the Power BI for Office 365 site, you'll need to set them up as users as well. So in the main admin center dashboard, there's the ability to set up users. So if I go to the next slide here, it's going to give you the ability to, to add users. Now you can add them one at a time, and it'll just simply prompt you for a user ID and a password for each one. Or if you've actually created a CSV ahead of time, you can actually bulk add users and, and upload a CSV file. I didn't include an example of this. It's pretty easy to follow along. So if you have 50 people that you want to uh, provision as users, you can, uh, you can do it that way. Uh, another thing to be aware of is what domain you want to utilize for your email address. Now, I just stuck with the basic kevinscottgolf.onmicrosoft.com just to keep this demo simple. You can actually utilize your own email server domain if you, if you, if you choose to do so. So that's what's involved with setting up users. Pretty, pretty easy, pretty easy task. The second thing is to have the portal set up and provision any any remaining services. And that's really just a matter of going to the services area, reading through the instructions here, and then basically taking done. Now this is going to tell you that if you want to actually go back and, and manage any services, you're going to go back to that main portal and go to Office 365 service settings. So this is really something to print out and, and uh, or just take a screen capture of and, and keep track of the, uh, of the links here, the main one being portal.office.com. So at that point, once you've gone through that, you actually have, have provision, or Power BI has provision, an Office 365 public SharePoint site. And mine happens to be, I actually have a couple of different URLs here. The, uh, the public one is going to be http kevinscottgoff-public.sharepoint.com. The, uh, the private one is going to be https kevinscottgoff.sharepoint.com. That's actually what I'm looking at. If I go back to the browser here, that's what I'm looking at right now. And if I click on the admin dropdown, well, I've got options to, uh, uh, to set any configurations for, for Office 365, from my SharePoint site, like if I want to set up any branding or any themes or any colors, and anything I want to do with the, uh, with the Power BI site. Now, at this point, you know, can I create some Excel content and push it up uh, into the site? The answer is no, not yet, because we still have to provision the Power BI site. So we're, we're halfway there at this point. The next step is to actually provision the Power BI area. So moving along here, the next thing you would do, actually if I come back to the browser here, is click on the admin dropdown and go to Power BI. I'm going to go to there right now, even though I've already provisioned this. And let me come back to my slide deck. Notice on the left-hand side, there are two options that we'll need to go through. One is creating a data source, and the other is a, uh, is a gateway. If we want to push up content, into a Power BI site, and then when the data refreshes back in our own server, you know, nightly, twice a day, whatever, 
and we want Power BI to read the data, even on a schedule, we have to set up a data source and we have to set up a gateway. So those are the next two steps here. Now they do involve uh, a few do involve a few things to be aware of, and we're going to get to them in just a minute. I, the same slide I had a little while ago, I'm actually going to repeat it because it's worth repeating. Again, the steps are that we push Excel content that we read from an Oracle database or SQL database up into a Power BI for Office 365 site, but then we have to have a gateway with a job scheduled so that when our data changes back on our site, Power BI for Office 365 can go read it. Well, we have to have a gateway established with a secure key. Obviously, we want to have a secure key so the gateway can go uh, can go read the data. Well, here's what's involved with that. In the Power BI admin site, on the left-hand side, the two options here are actually data sources and then gateways. If you go to data sources first, it's actually going to tell you, well, you can't really create a data source until you build a gateway. So it's going to ask us if we uh, want to install a gateway. We'll say yes to that. Now, what it's going to do next is it's going to download, if you don't already have it installed on your server, it's going to download a tool called Microsoft uh, Gateway Management. It's a, it's, a, it's, a client, it's a small client application. Now, I didn't put it here in the slide deck, probably should have. Uh, something that I got uh, bit on the first time I tried this, I wasn't running Windows Server. I was actually just running uh, Windows, uh, uh, Windows 8 uh, Professional. Uh, to my knowledge, the Microsoft Gateway Management Client, if, if it can work on, on a Windows 8 Pro machine as a, as a test, I'm not aware of it. I, I tried and tried and tried to get it to run on, on Windows 8 and just as a test and it couldn't, so I uh, just fired up a VM and set up Windows Server and did it that way. So unless, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stand corrected if I'm wrong, but uh, to the best of my awareness, the, uh, the gateway is only going to work in a, uh, in a Windows Server environment. So you need to download that, and that's a very small download. And that'll actually pop up the, uh, the Gateway Configuration Manager once it's installed on Windows Server. Now, back on the first page here, when, when it prompted you to download the, uh, the Gateway Client, it generated a Gateway Key, this long string of numbers. Now, by the way, I have since reprovisioned my Gateway, so somebody might say, geez, Kevin, aren't you, aren't you taking a risk by putting a Gateway Key up here? I've actually changed since then, so this Gateway Key is actually not even valid anymore. Well, once that generates a gateway key, what we need to do in the configuration manager, there is a button to it to change the gateway key. We actually copy and paste in the uh, the gateway key that was assigned back in Power BI for Office 365. That's the link between Power BI for Office 365 and our and our on-premises, our, our on-site version of SQL Server or uh, whatever whatever you happen to be running. Now, once we set up that gateway and provide the key that was generated by Power BI for Office 365, we're going to the next slide here, then we need to provide the connection information for our database. Power BI needs to know what database to go read. Now, the data source type here I've set is a SQL Server, and I'm using the, the OADB provider for SQL Server. I didn't put it in here, but you need to provide your server name and the name of the database. So, even if it's uh, just my company server slash SQL 2012 or whatever your database server happens to be, you need to provide that as well as the name of the database. Now, you also need to provide credentials so that when the Power BI for Office 365 data refresh runs, coming back here a couple of slides, when that refresh runs and it's going to read back to the SQL Server site, it needs to know an account to it to connect to that data source. If you've ever done any type of uh, reporting services jobs, you know that uh, you need to provide uh, stored credentials, secured stored credentials on the server, so that when the job runs, it can run through an account. Well, in this case, I provided uh, my Windows credentials on my, on my test server, just administrator, and then the password I provided. Now, I, I wasn't running any, uh, any kind of, uh, of uh, of security certificate or any SSL or anything like that, but you can set up the encryption. I didn't do it here, but it is uh, available as an option. And then obviously you want to do a, a test. So once you've gone through those steps, 
Well, Power BI for Office 365 can now read back to your data source when you set up a data refresh. This is huge. If you want the content that you pushed up into a Power BI for Office 365 site to read back to your database when the data changes, again, daily, nightly, however often it, uh, however often it would be. Okay, so at that point, the Power BI for us Power BI for Office 365 site is, is ready for us to push up content and, uh, and set up refreshes uh, based upon how often our data gets updated. Well, let's go back and let's talk about the key components inside of Power BI itself. Power Pivot, Power View, Power Query, and Power Maps. Again, we could spend hours talking about each one of these topics, so I'm just going to give a, a top line on each one. Power Pivot, first of all, is not brand new. Power Pivot was it was demoed back in the 2009 time period. You might remember uh, people showing demos at, uh, at SQL Server user groups, some of the user groups where you could use Excel and point to databases of 20, 30 million rows, bring them in very quickly, and compress them into a nice little mini cube inside of Excel. Well, for the people out there who have created OLAP cubes with analysis services, where you uh, build a data mart, or some type of, of some type of fact dimension structure in SQL Server, and then you build OLAP cubes off of it. When you create Power Pivot content in Excel, it seems a little bit familiar. Well, it's not a coincidence because essentially what is happening is when we fire up Excel and we use Power Pivot to point to some mashup of data, whether it's fact dimension tables or other types of tables, the process that we go through is not unlike what you might see with a cube wizard because essentially in the basement of Excel, the way I like to put it, there is a compressed star schema model of the data that we pull from SQL Server wherever we point it to. Well, once we do that, we can create pivot tables or, or pivot charts off of that model. So uh, if I had more time, I would actually, I want to make sure I get through everything here. If I had more time, I would actually walk through a quick example. But, uh, you can obviously find many of those online and, and probably in some of the prior, uh, prior some of the prior past webinars as well. Now one thing to be aware of, depending upon whether you create uh, power pivot content from uh, from one source or from from many sources, is the relationships that you might need to set up depending upon how that data is structured. Now some people might use Power Pivot against data that's already been shaped in, in fact dimension structures. Other people might create Power Pivot content against just one flat table. So if you're creating against one flat table, there's not going to be much modeling that, get, that gets involved, but if you're using Power Pivot against something that's already been shaped in fact dimension structures, you may have to create the relationships unless they already exist. Now in this case, this Power Pivot content that I created was against the AdventureWorks database that already had primary key form key relationships in it. Those relationships come into Power Pivot. So those, the, the relationship uh, diagram here already reflects the, uh, the primary key form key relationships between the tables so that we can slice sales by product or by promotion or by geography or whatever. Now one other thing to be aware of if you're coming at this from uh, the perspective of, of having built OLAP cubes in the past, Again, there's some parallel between how you build an OLAP cube and how you might create the content here, but it doesn't have all of the bells and whistles of OLAP. For instance, if you bring in fact dimension structures and you're expecting to get more advanced relationships like, uh, uh, like many-to-many -many relationships or role-playing relationships where a dimension can play multiple roles in a fact table, those don't exist in, in core power pivot. You'd have to actually write some code to supplement, uh, to supplement what Power Pivot doesn't uh, provide. I'll get into that a little bit later. Now, once you've built the Power Pivot content, and I'm going to actually come over here briefly to an Excel and kind of reverse engineer something. Here's my Excel spreadsheet, the original spreadsheet that I deployed up into a Power Pivot, or up into a Power BI for Office 365 site. If I go to Power Pivot, and I go manage the existing model here. Well, I've got fact tables for sales, for returns, for return thresholds, and a couple of different dimension tables. 
and I can go to the uh, I can go to the diagram view if I want to see how those fact dimension structures are are put together. So I can zoom that out and at least a little bit easier to read. Now, as I said a little while ago, we might have to write some uh, some code, some DAX code to uh, to supplement uh, to supplement what Power Pivot uh, actually provides. One example of that, if I come back to my data view, I might need calculations. Let me go to the uh, returns area. I might need something as simple as a returns percent, where I have to take the uh, the return dollars divided by the sales. Or I might need to get, let me stretch this out a little bit so I can read it. I might need to calculate a, uh, a returns goal that comes from another fact table, and I might need to average it over a couple of other dimensions. So once again, we might need to write some DAX code in addition to the uh, measures that we brought in from whatever source, uh, whatever source system we pointed the data to originally. So in this example here, we were using the KPI capability that's available in, uh, in Power Pivot and Excel to, uh, in this case, compare uh, sales uh, that somebody has to a, uh, to a quota. And again, we have to have a DAX formula to express the uh, quota in terms of sales for the same time period a year ago. And other types of content from, uh, from Power Pivot, we can, uh, we can implement hierarchies. So back in that dimension editor, if we've got a geography definition that goes from country to uh, state to city uh, or, or whatever, we can actually define those hierarchies back in, the, back in the diagram view, and then those are going to be rendered in Excel. So this looks a lot like, again, if you're familiar with uh, creating Excel content against OLAP cubes, we're getting a lot of the same functionality because, again, in effect, Right now in the spreadsheet, in the basement of the spreadsheet, lives the equivalent of a star schema cube, if you want to think of it that way. Again, uh, a moving average, another uh, type of, uh, of calculation that we might need a DAX formula for if we want to render a moving average as a, uh, as a line and plot it against uh, sales so that we see for any one month whether our sales are above or below what our 12-month average has been over a period of time. If anyone wants to uh, talk further, has any questions about how these calculations are put together, again, feel free to uh, email me. I'll put my email address back up uh, on the screen at the end here. Uh, thing just to be aware of is that we might need to write DAX formulas in order to uh, implement certain calculations against a power pivot model. And again, uh, spark lines are available in Excel, pretty easy to put together so that we can show a nice, very compressed trend line and, and a high-low of where sales have been, in this case, by country for, for the different months throughout the year. Now, speaking of DAX itself, as I said, Power Pivot provides a language called DAX. And this is an expression language. It is, very loosely speaking, it is to Power Pivot as, as MDX is to OLAP cubes. And for that matter, as T-SQL is to relational databases. Now, I, it's, a very, it's a very loose analogy. There are definitely some differences between all of these languages, but loosely speaking, when we want to create our own custom calculations in, in OLAP cubes, we write MDX. We want to create our own custom calculations in Power Pivot, we use DAX. Now, you can find books on DAX, you can find a lot of websites on DAX. Uh, I mentioned Chris Webb. Chris Webb has a lot of good blog entries on DAX. Uh, you go up to Amazon and find some books on DAX. I do want to. I do want to make, if uh, part of the expression, almost a, a political statement about DAX. You might see some websites that will say DAX is easier than MDX. Well, that depends. For basic formulas, that's probably true. DAX is probably a little bit easier than MDX for for basic formulas like uh, taking the sum of one number and dividing it by another one to come up with a with a weighted average. But for, for more complicated expressions, say trying to calculate sales for the same time period a year ago, or calculating a moving average where we need to, for any one month, determine what was the 12-month range over the last 12 months and then sum or average the data over that period, DAX can be just as involved as MDX. So on the statement that DAX is easier than MDX, well, that, that may be true, it might not be true. It, uh, just, again, simply depends upon what you're trying to calculate. But there's a key point worth bringing up here. 
as I said, uh, when comparing PowerPivot to something like full-blown analysis services OLAP, PowerPivot doesn't support uh, some of the more advanced relationships like, uh, like role-playing relationships and, and bridge table relationships. So you have to actually write some DAX code to manually set those relationships. So at the end of the day, can you get role-playing functionality where, again, for a fact table, you could have a, uh, an order date and a due date and a ship date. Can you get that out of Power Pivot? At the end of the day, you can. You've just got to write some code to supplement it. And the same thing with bridge tables. You can't get it out of the core uh, uh, data designer, but you can write DAX formulas to it to bridge the gap. And again, if anybody has questions, wants to talk about them further, feel free to uh, email me. So uh, just to spin through a couple of uh, DAX formulas here very quickly, uh, here's a formula that uh, takes the, uh, the percent of uh, quota to the same time period a year ago, where we want to express an existing measure in terms of one year ago. Well, DAX has a parallel period function, also has another function called same period last year, uh, multiple ways to get at it. The point is that uh, there is going to be a, a little bit of work involved. And for a moving average, uh, if you've ever tried to calculate a moving average, a couple ways to do it, but essentially we need to determine for any one month, well, what was the range of the last 12 months based upon the current month, and then sum or average or whatever we want to do the measure over that range of 12 months. So again, it can be just as involved as, uh, as MDX. Now, uh, I'm going to move quickly here. I actually have a few minutes uh, left. Uh, fortunately, uh, I've gotten through the, uh, the heavy stuff. Uh, PowerView, very quickly. PowerView, one of the newer tools in the, uh, in the whole self-service uh, BI area. It's a, it's a visualization tool for power users, and it's great for storyboarding type, storyboard type reporting, or what I call face-style reporting, as opposed to full-blown detail reports that can be 20, 30, 100 pages long. It's not it doesn't have as much full-blown developer functionality as reporting services. You can't write uh, code in PowerView. You, you don't have report expressions. You don't have runtime uh, formulas that you can put in. So it's really more for the power user crowd, but it definitely has some nice capabilities. Now, many people have probably seen this kind of demo before, but uh, just to go over very quickly, one of the nicest visualizations in, in PowerView is the ability to have an animated scatter chart. Uh, so as, as one example, we might have some analytic need where we want to take a look at uh, for a particular geography, maybe the cities in Oregon. And we want to see is there a relationship between the number of customers in a city and their revenue. Now for that matter, any scatter chart, we're looking to plot any strong correlation between measure A and measure B. Well, what we can actually do is, is create a scatter chart. And because this is just a, a static uh, slide deck, I can't show the animation, but there's a play axis down here where we can actually play the, uh, the progression of, uh, of the intersection points of, of customer count and sales over a period of time for some or all the cities within, in this case, Oregon. Very, very, nice, uh, very nice visualization. Now, it doesn't do some of the things that an Excel chart can do. Like for instance, it doesn't let you show a, a, a regression line or a slope line. It doesn't let you calculate something like a correlation coefficient. But you might use this as a prototype first and then maybe take one example and then build a more advanced chart in Excel. And we can even uh, select one city and actually see the, uh, the progression. So there's, a again, a lot of uh, nice runtime animation that uh, we can do here with, uh, with the scatter chart. Now the other thing that this has the ability to do, there are other types of charts within PowerView. There, uh, there are pie charts, there are bar charts, there are line charts, and they, they certainly don't have the full-blown functionality of, of a chart in Excel or reporting services, but in addition to having the ability to have uh, different filters here. Another thing that it does have that's very nice is cross-filtering capability. So I can be looking at, uh, at a pie chart here that's broken up by country, select one country, and that will filter out or, or filter in that particular country in another chart on the page. So there's some nice cross-filtering that goes on in PowerView. So for certain types of analysis, for what I call, again, face-style reporting or face-style charting, it's going to be very, very handy. 
All right, uh, just a couple minutes to go here. Uh, Power Maps. Now, Power Maps and Power Query, the last two parts of, uh, of Power BI, I don't want to say that they are niche features, but uh, probably maybe a slightly smaller percent of people are going to use them, although certainly over time this is going to gain some popularity. Power Maps, as the name applies, allows you to create map visualizations based upon uh, maybe a, a sales table that we have of sales by country or by region or by city where we have the names in the table. So we can actually create a table that has that information and point Power Maps, again, an add-in within, uh, within Excel to that data, and it'll actually generate some pretty nice maps for us. So taking a look at two very, very simple examples. This was done with nothing more than a table that had uh, sales, by, uh, sales by city. And so it's plotting the, uh, the cities where all we did was just simply provide the name. We have a table with just the name of the city and sales, and it's actually plotting it. Now, I could have broken this out further by year or by product. I took a very, very simple definition. Now, if you happen to have latitude or longitude points, it will actually render them as well if you happen to have that kind of information. That can be particularly advantageous coming to the next slide here. If maybe we provided latitude and longitude data for maybe store level data within a city. I didn't do that here. I'm, I'm, I'm still on city, but I've, I've zoomed it in so we can actually see some of the cities here in Oregon and Washington. But if I had actually provided latitude and longitude data, it would have actually been able to, let me drill down further, you know, at the, at the maybe at the retail store, retail store level within a city. This, again, scratches the surface of what Power Maps can do. Uh, on the Power BI site, there's, uh, there's some links to some, uh, some public demos of Power Maps that go way, way beyond what I've demonstrated here. All right, Power Query. First of all, if you want to read more about Power Query, a little shout out to, uh, to Chris Webb. One of the, if you don't know Chris Webb, one of the smartest guys around when it comes to SQL and BI, very common sense approach to everything, and also a heck of a nice guy, and uh, can't say enough about him and his contributions that he's made to the SQL and BI world. Uh, so if you want to get into Power Query, uh, check, out his, uh, check out his book. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. Power Query is essentially ETL against open sources that can allow us to uh, use a query language from within Excel to shape data in such a way that we can create pivot tables off of it. Now, example I did here uh, ahead of time. I'm a big sports fan. I my, my, uh, don't know how many football fans out there there are, but uh, my favorite football team in the United States is the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm not doing too well right now this year, but uh, there's still time. Well, one of their greatest years was 1997. And as most sports fans know, you can go up to online sites and actually get statistics. So if I actually go to pro, pro footballreference.com and specify the name and the, uh, name of the team in the year, well, it actually has several HTML tables that have their information, that have the information on, you know, their wins and losses and how many points they scored, how many yards they gave up. Well, what I wanted to do was just simply point to that URL, and that actually constructs some Power Query syntax that I could modify here if I wanted to, if I wanted to shape this data or maybe optionally bring in some rows, and put it into a pivot table such that I can build some type of Power View chart that, in this case, uh, let me build a scatter chart between their uh, the number of points that they scored in any one game and the number of yards their defense gave. I'm, I'm sorry, the number of points they surrendered and the number of yards that they gave up. So here, if you're a football analyst at all, uh, you might see from here that uh, it doesn't matter if they were only giving up 15 or 20 or 30 points, they were still largely surrendering the same amount of yards every game. It was only when they started surrendering well less than 15 points that they were surrendering less yards per game. So a little bit of analysis that we can do once we pull in data from a public site. Again, you can pull back uh, public information from Facebook, from Wikipedia, from many government sources with nothing more than a URL. Now, again, uh, Chris's book goes into a lot of uh, details on how you can do this. His blog, his site has some examples as well. If you want to know more about Power Query, he's the, uh, he's the person to look at. Now, deploying content up to a Power BI for Office 365 site, extremely easy. All you need to do, and if I come back here to my browser area, let me see if, uh, how quickly this will uh, load here. All 
all we need to do if we want to push up a spreadsheet is simply take the option in our Power BI site once we've, uh, once we've uh, provisioned it. There's an option here under Power BI to simply just add documents from your local drive or from a shared network drive. It's really as simple as that. So not much to the uh, deployment at all. As far as setting up data refreshes back to on-premises sources, that's also pretty easy. All that we need to do is just simply point to any particular chart or pivot table we've already deployed up uh, to a Power BI site, click on the ellipsis button, and then as I come back to my slide deck here, take the option in the shortcut menu for a data refresh. And that will confirm which data source you want to use because you could conceivably have more than one that you set up in connection with your gateway. Provide how often you want to do it, daily, weekly, monthly, whatever, and then a time period and a notification. That's it. Refreshes are very simple. The hard work was setting up, if you want to call it hard, was setting up the gateway and making sure that that works. And then finally, so I uh, went five minutes over here, hopefully not too bad. Uh, the, uh, the WPC conference back uh, a few months ago, back in, I believe, in July, uh, Jen Underwood and uh, Chris Webb had some great coverage on, uh, on Power BI News from the WPC as well as uh, some, uh, some discussion of some of the new features that are being added to Power BI uh, a little bit down the road. So I've got five different links here that talk about them, and basically a quick list of them. They're going to have a new KPI dashboard editor, and some people are speculating this might be a possible replacement, or, or at least a, a counterpart for what's in Performance Point Services. Again, I love Performance Point Services. I, I thought it was a tremendous product. Uh, it's not part of Office uh, 365, but the new KPI and dashboard editor in Power BI for Office 365 may, uh, may bridge that gap. There's some new data visualization, some new types of charts that are available. And then this third bullet point, if you're a developer working in a BI environment, I, I cannot stress how huge this may wind up being for a lot of organizations. Right now, there's no support for reporting services reports in a Power BI for Office 365 site. That, that's a big question people ask is, you know, in addition to pushing up Excel documents, and Power Pivot documents up here, you know, Power BI for Office 365 site, can we push up reporting services reports? And can those reports utilize the gateway back to an on-premise data source? Well, the answer is not yet, but that's coming. So a feature down the road, there's been no time period uh, announced, but something coming down the road that they have announced is support for reporting services reports that can point back to on-premises data sources. I, I, I try not to get too excited about new news until it actually comes out, but I, I, I literally almost jumped for joy when I heard about that. That is, that is going to be a game changer for a number of uh, places. And also some, uh, some native support for other data sources uh, like Microsoft Dynamics, Facebook, Google Analytics, and, uh, and Twitter. So, that, uh, and finally, there's a, there's a chart here, if you want to take a look at the end, just a, another, uh, another way to look at the, uh, the gateway as it's going to, as it's going to uh, impact uh, when, we, when we have uh, reporting services report for Power BI for Office 365. Again, uh, follow Chris Webb's blog. It's just uh, cwebbi.wordpress.com. You can obviously Google his name and find it as well. Uh, I'm sure he's going to be reporting on this as, uh, as we get more information on the, uh, the release on it. So that that covers it. A lot of lot of content here. You can see why I did this in slide decks and try to minimize the the uh, the running demos back in the browser would have uh, taken even longer. Uh, again, the slide deck will be up on my site uh, in about an hour. It's just www.kevinsgoff.net. Feel free to uh, email me if you have any questions. My email address is kgoff at uh, kevinsgoff.net, and uh, I'll happily go through any uh, any questions that have uh, that have come up. So hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody got at least one piece of, uh, of of important information out of this. All right, thank so you, we'll Kevin. Turn it back over to. Uh, no, sorry, <laughs> I just interrupted there. Thanks, Kevin, for the um, for the great presentation. We've got a uh, quite a few questions here, but because we're running out of time, would you mind if I just send them to you so you can answer via um, and post the answers to your on your blog? Is that okay? Uh, sure. Yeah. 
tell you what, if you um, if you check you know, on my blog, it's just www.kevinescoff.net. Uh, I'll have the answers. I've done. I have to read through them. I take me a little bit of time, but uh, check my website by tomorrow, if not if not late tonight, and I'll get some uh, get some responses up there. Uh, yeah. If anybody has any questions, they want to include or any email addresses of theirs, they want to include in there. They want to correspond with me. Feel free to email me. Yeah, that's great. So as I mentioned, this session is being recorded. That's why I thought I'll just let you uh, let you do your thing, <laughs> so that if people have to leave early, they can just um, watch the uh, the parts that they've missed or whatever um, from our YouTube um, channel, which is youtube.com/slash user/slash passbifc. All right, thank you so much, Kevin, for a great presentation. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate your time, and thanks everyone for attending. I'm going to stop the session recording now, and um, if Kevin could stay with me for a bit, that would be great. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, everybody, Bye. for attending.